And so here we come on this journey. Now we're coming into Jerusalem as we've been uh, together throughout this book. And I, I'm excited because we get to see why Jesus did these things for us. And at the same, it's, it's sobering, but at the same time exciting because we have a way of escape. We have a way of escape for, from our sins. And he gives us that peace and knowing and assurance and knowing that we have a place prepared for us in heaven where he says he will return for us one day and we wait with anticipation of that and I pray that we continue to wait in anticipation of that we continue to look up because our redemption is drawing near in verse 28 it says this when he had said this you know the parable he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem Circumstances were such now that the decision to go to Jerusalem could not be stopped. It couldn't be stopped. This was the direction and the fulfillment. And the way Jesus approached Jerusalem was key. It was of utmost importance. And when he was in Galilee, Jesus took a different approach than when he visited Jerusalem. He took a different approach in both areas. How so? Well, in Galilee, he kept his Messiahship veiled. He told those he healed not to say anything. You remember those things, those times? In Matthew 8, 1 through 4, it says, Jesus heals the leper and then tells him, See thou, see thou tell no man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And in Mark 8, 27, uh, 26, he says, Jesus had just healed the blind man and tells him, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. And he told his three disciples to keep silent about what? The transfiguration? Until when? Until he has risen. Keep silent. See, when excitement and enthusiasm grew, Jesus kept out of reach. Because he didn't want them setting him up. When he wasn't supposed to be set up as king here on earth, they misinterpreted what the goal was. They didn't understand. And we know that. John tells us that they didn't understand until he rose from the dead. Then they realized. Then they understood what was the message that he was teaching. J.D. Jones, one of England's most popular preachers at the turn of the century, he preached alongside men like D.L. Moody. And he wrote this. The reason for this reserve on the part of Jesus is not hard to discover. Galilee was in an inflammable condition. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. An inflammable condition. Why? Because the Romans were over Palestine. And how did they get there? We're going to look at that more next week. I want to get in that today, but we won't. <laughs> and then he goes on. The people were on their tiptoe of expectation. Every messianic pretender was sure of finding followers in Galilee. If Jesus had proclaimed himself Messiah, the smoldering excitement would have blazed up into the flame of open revolt. A thousand swords would have leaped out of their scabbards and insurrection would have been the order of the day. Even as it was, on one occasion they tried to take him by force and make him king in Herod's stead, and that was not the kind of kingdom Jesus had in view at all. And it's not the kind of kingdom he had in view, even, till, even still today. They wanted to take up arms, make, it, make him their king right then and there. And it was primed and ready to go. That's how the feelings were. That's what the expectation was. So while that's while he's in Galilee. But while in Jerusalem, Jesus did the exact opposite. See, throughout his public ministry, Jesus visited Jerusalem briefly. And he never visited without asserting his Messiahship one way or another. He did this the first time by sweeping out the sacred precincts, those who bought and sold within them, and by speaking of the temple as his father's house. He did so on his second visit by healing 
the impotent man at the pool of Bethsaida and by claiming in response to the challenge of the Jews that he shared in the privileges and prerogatives of God and he did so the third time by proclaiming himself as light of the world by healing the man who had been born blind and by declaring plainly in answer to the blind man's question that he himself was the long promised Messiah of God Jerusalem was the capital it's where the leaders and the priests lived and as a result he took every opportunity to proclaim who he was and if Jerusalem rejected him they could not plead ignorance and there was no excuse Jesus does that today doesn't he he makes it very plain as to who he is in his word if that's what you're looking for if you're looking for the Messiah he'll reveal himself to you but if you're and that's because his word comes out to and speaks to our hearts but if you're peering in trying to make it your words change the words up well then you're gonna make it to anything that you desire but he reveals himself plainly in his word if we would just but see it at the time Jesus was walking the earth it wasn't as clear today it is clear for us and we have a choice to make if they rejected him at that time they couldn't plead ignorance and there was no excuse and the more we proclaim and preach Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and give people God's word they'll have to make a decision there will be no excuse because what did we talk about last week it's not the Lord that sends anybody to hell it's ourselves when we don't decide to make a decision for Jesus I know many people don't like to hear that but that's what the Bible teaches us now we might think well that's not true Jesus hid himself from the Pharisees too but John 7 8 and 9 tells us you go up to the feast I am not yet going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. See, he was not avoiding the capture. He was just awaiting for the appointed time. So he was making his messiahship known. But he was avoiding capture for until the appointed time of capture. Jesus' earthly ministry was leading up to this. This is what he came to do. This was his total purpose. In Galilee, he veiled himself so that people would not want to overthrow the government that is what they were looking to do that's what they were primed up for jesus said his kingdom was what not of what world it's not of this world but on the other side jesus made himself known clearly and a few times he visited jerusalem which is why he needed to avoid it until the appointed time until now this was the appointed time and we're going to look at what the appointed time means and how it relates to prophecy because he fulfills a few prophecies here that's why this message I entitled it sobering prophecies because they are sobering when we really get down and think about it verse 29 through 38 read this if I can find them myself Then it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying go into the village opposite you where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat loose it and bring it here and if anyone asks you why are you loosing it thus you shall say to him because the Lord has need of it so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set, they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen saying blessed is the king who comes in the name of the lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest napoleon is reported to have said this alexander caesar charlemagne and i have founded great empires 
But upon what did these creatures of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded an empire upon love, and to this day millions would die for him. Ooh, so good. Do you find yourself in that force, in that army of love? Because often we don't. We often find our hearts in hatred. But of love, like the scriptures we were reading today, because we could become so self-centered. This is how Jesus comes into Jerusalem. How? In humility and in love. So it's about A.D. 30, right? Jesus came on the scene 30 years ago. He's approximately 33. He's in his third year of ministry. And even though this might, not be, the, this might be the prime of his life, he knew what was coming within less than a week to go. He was acutely aware of where he was headed, and yet here he is doing ministry still and coming as a loving king. Do you think maybe he, he would want, I know I would, I would want to take out the enemies and set up my kingdom and show my force and my strength. It was strength reserved in him, in human form. And he held that back. Why? To fulfill his call. To fulfill the mission. Can you imagine what kind of power that would take? What kind of humility that would take? And we don't often put ourselves low. He did it even while we were yet sinners, it says in the Bible. Pretty amazing. And yet we won't even do it for people that we know love us. We want the primary position. That's why all this time he's been talking about laying down your life. And here he is showing you the example of what it's going to take. That's what we talked about yesterday in the men's study, in the men's breakfast. About laying down your life, about being a disciple. And what the cost is of discipleship. Because many times our mind and our attention is off of what it truly means. And so in verse 29, we're introduced to two towns, Bethany and Bethphage. I hope I say that right. I always get weird with that word. But the road that Jesus took came to these two cities. And it was about two miles away from Jerusalem. You first came to Bethany and then to Bethphage, two miles away. And it said at this point that the elevation is about 2,600 feet above sea level and you could see down as you're traveling in this breathtaking view of Jerusalem I personally have not been there I desire to go I haven't taken this road but in his book the temple uh, the Jewish man Alfred Edersheim who turned uh, uh, Christian uh, he's a historian he writes this from whatever side the pilgrim might approach the city Think about this for a moment. The first impression must have been solemn and deep. You think about that for a moment. I remember going to the Grand Canyon, and I had never been there. Been there two or three times now. Love it. Anybody been there? And you're driving in. <laughs> you're driving in. You don't know what to expect. You've only seen pictures. And you got all these uh, uh, trees... Uh, about you know this tall and you're driving through beautiful roads the park is beautiful and all of a sudden you come into the main area and then you it just opens up and you see the Grand Canyon and you're just blown away because it looks like a picture it doesn't even look real and you're just blown I don't know how you felt but I know I was just mesmerized it was amazing and that's the kind of picture I get can you imagine the picture here I mean, of, a, of something that you've never seen before. We even went to Mount Rushmore, and we saw those, you know, those uh, faces there in the stone, and we were just blown away by that. But I can only imagine what this impression was. It was solemn and deep. He goes on, But a social surprise awaited those who came, whether from Jericho or from Galilee, by the well-known road that led over the Mount of Olives. From the south beyond royal Bethlehem, 
from the west descending over the heights of Beth Haran or from the north journeying along the mountains of Ephraim they would have seen the city first vaguely looming in the gray distance till gradually approaching they had become familiar with its outlines and it was by this road Jesus made his triumphal entry from Bethany on the week of his passion what a great picture the holy city where God had placed his name and here he comes to his own city and Jesus sends two disciples ahead to get this colt for him and it's a colt the foal of a donkey that nobody had sat on before now why is that important for us to point out because in numbers 19 2 it tells us why and the Jews regarded it tells us why the Jews regarded animals never burdened they were for holy purposes so they would understand what Jesus was uh, talking or what, what he was actually doing here and Matthew's the only writer that tells us about the mare and the young donkey. Um, we don't know why he points that out. It could have been to help lead the foal along, but we don't know. Matthew 21, 4 and 5 tells us there was a prophecy fulfilled right here, though. It says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And it's a direct quote from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Now, think about this. The Jews responded to titles and accolades fit only for the Messiah. I mean, they loved this stuff. They ate it up. It was representation to them. They loved the traditions and what things meant in the pictures and so they would understand very clearly what Jesus was doing here riding in they would recall Zechariah riding in on a donkey that nobody's ever sat upon before in humility they would understand the meaning of all he was attempting to do and to demonstrate now he sends these two to go in this village opposite them and he sends them with very specific instructions don't you wish jesus would do that all the time he gives them very specific instructions go here do this this might happen so if that might happen then do this and say this and he doesn't do that all the time does he i hate that don't you hate that i want to know every single thing like lord where's the surrender church going to be in two weeks Will we be here? Or will, why not give us the same instructions? Well, have you asked me, son? Maybe I will. I don't know. But what if he doesn't? It's so cool, though, how he works so differently, you know, in everybody's life. So what a great picture. Now, some commentators mention that Jesus and his disciples are well known in this area. After all, Bethany was home to who? Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now you can take that view if you want. I like to think that the Holy Spirit prepared the hearts for this. Because I like to look at the spiritual side. Don't you like to look at the spiritual side? I like to see the Lord uh, in His providence uh, putting the pieces of the puzzle together without us knowing, without us seeing. I would rather be led but like that because then I know I'm always going to be in God's perfect will. I'm always know that I'm going to have to surrender. That's why we named this church what we did. It's a reminder to always surrender to His will, and I don't always want to do that. But I like to think that it's His providence at work. Do you understand what providence is? I love this guy, J.I. Packer. I quote him a lot, but he has this great book about concise theology, just breaking, breaking theology down in simplistic ways. And he writes this about God's providence. It's the doctrine of providence that teaches Christians that they are never in the grip of blind forces. Not fortune, not chance, not luck, not fate. All that happens to them is divinely planned, and each event comes as a new summons to trust, obey, and rejoice, knowing that all is for one spiritual and eternal good. 
If it's happening to me, it must be for my good. Is it a result of my poor decision? And am I learning from it? Then it's for my good. Right? So good. That's, the de that's a good definition. And he tells them, hey, if somebody asks you, the Lord has need of it. That's what you should share. We see this verse 31 through 34. Now, part of the specific instructions was a prescribed, a prescribed response. Why would he do that if you're asked? Why would he say if you're asked? If he didn't already know that that's what was going to happen. They could recall that to mind. Oh, Jesus already gave us the words to say if we're asked. Doesn't he do that in his word? He already prescribed what we're supposed to say. We're not supposed to always worry. Don't talk about what you don't know. Talk about what you do know. When people are asking you difficult questions to try to trip you up, you ever have that? People in your life like that? Just trying to mess with you as a Christian? Talk about what you do know. Because what did the Apostle Paul say? I don't want to know anything but Christ and Him crucified. That's all you need to know. But then he says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Know his word. He's already given you the prescribed information. It's all right here. If you're getting into it. He gives us specific instructions, doesn't he? He absolutely does. And check this out. We see in their answer. Can you imagine? Oh, they did ask us. And we know what to say. <laughs> you know? And they, and, and they responded ex exactly how they were commanded to respond. And that's what the Lord tells us to do. Don't add to my word. Don't take away from my word. Just tell them what I told you to say. That's it. No more, no less. And that's exactly what they did. Obedient servants. And you know what? It was just my duty to do. That's it. I'm not to worry about the outcome. Did he tell them, hey, and, and once you tell them that, and then they're going to give it to you? He didn't say that. They didn't know what to expect after that. I'm just supposed to tell them. And then let's see what God does. They say, yeah, okay, go for it. Take them. Isn't that awesome? So cool. Important point. They were only to say what Jesus said. When you're asked about things of the Lord, only do what he tells you to, to do and to say. And he always gives us the words to speak. But are we obedient in that? See, we get emotional sometimes. We get all worked up. Sometimes in our anxiety of anticipation of a situation, we begin to preform our responses. And it's hard when we do that because we not, might not even be listening to what somebody is saying and we already have our response and it may be the incorrect response. Let's wait upon the Lord. Let's not allow our emotions to drive uh, our decision making and do we know his word do we know his word you know it's interesting because as we're reading these when I'm going through my own devotional time I read through the some books of the New Testament some of the old so as I was reading through the book of Luke weeks ago I wrote this by because the Lord has need of it I wrote the Lord uh, forgive my writing it's small the Lord allowed unsung Presbyterian Church um, to be loosened because he had need of it. And he allowed us to come in. That's what I wrote right here weeks ago. How cool. I was reminded of that. I don't know. That's an aside. But the disciples knew what to say and to do. The owners knew how to respond. <laughs> but this is interesting to me. How come nobody asked the donkey what he wants to do? Right? Well, we think, well, obviously. I mean, he's God's creation. We've, he, we've been put over God's creation. They just do what we tell them to do. God's creatures just tell them to do what we tell them to do. But check this out. We're the only creatures that God made that fight against our Maker. We're the only creatures that fight against our maker. Isaiah 1.3 says, The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. And so we're, we're the type of people that fight against our maker. I like what H.A. Ironside writes. He writes this, 
The lower creatures act in subjection to the will of the Lord. Man alone of all God's creatures, who is made a little lower than the angels, with his remarkable powers and his wonderful intellect, sets himself in opposition to the will of God. We're the only ones that do it. I mean, who's the real donkeys, right? <laughs> That's us. I was going to say another word, but I don't think you can do that in church, can you? You guys know what I mean. <laughs> Verses 30, let's move on before we get in trouble here. Let's move on. Verse 35, we come to, and, it, and just a reminder, it says, Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We're told now that they set Jesus on the donkey. Isn't that interesting? He's deity, isn't he? But we get to see his two natures. He's deity getting up on this donkey, but they set him up there. Why does he need help? Can he just jump up and, you know, <laughs> do something like that? Jump up and sit on him? No, they set him on him. Deity and humanity, the two natures of Christ. And it goes on to tell us that the people laid their clothes on the ground. Matthew and Mark tell us about the leafy branches they were laying down. And this was an ancient practice, and we find it in 2 Kings chapter 9. And what was it a sign of? It was a sign of acknowledgement of their submission to Him as Lord, as Savior, as Messiah, that they were under His feet. You know, when you're praying in the morning or whenever you pray, whatever your devotional time is, we should be praying all day, incessantly. But whenever, whenever you get that quiet time with the Lord, do you ever just bow your head and think, Lord, I'm just putting myself under your feet. You're the master, not me. This is what they were doing right here, right now. A sign of homage to the Lord. And even more of a sign is what they were saying. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, it says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were shouting part of the Hallel which was this Jewish prayer that's recited during Jewish holidays. It's Psalm 118, and it's a messianic psalm. They knew what they were doing. Save now, save now. And the people were calling him what? Son of David, another messianic title. You don't think they knew what they were proclaiming at the time? They knew who he was. They knew what they were proclaiming. But see, their vision was still off. Their vision was off because they were ex their, all that anticipation of a Messiah to overthrow the Roman, Roman government. Anything like that happening today? All this anticipation of a man to, you know, a lot of Christians think, oh, he's going to take the country in the right direction. No, who takes the country in the right direction? God. And he moves the hearts of anybody in office anybody what does the bible say he puts one up he puts one down it's all on him it's all under his control we do what god tells us to do but the outcome is up to the lord what can i do they knew exactly what he was what they were proclaiming and he was not hiding his messiahship at all in front of anyone anymore why it's to set everything in motion now because the appointed time is here. And check this out. What about these Roman soldiers watching? Why were they neutral on all of this? Why didn't they step in and put a stop to all this stuff going on? Well, they weren't threatened. This was nothing to them. There was no anxiety in their lives. They were probably standing around going, what in the world is going on here? You know? Why? Well, the Romans were experts at parades and official public events. We call this event the triumphal entry, but no Roman would have ever used that term. 
ever. An official Roman triumph was an actual thing, and it was something to behold and to watch. When a Roman general came back to Rome after a complete conquest of an enemy, he was welcomed home with an elaborate official parade. And in that parade, he would, he would have all of his trophies of war, uh, all of his prisoners that he had captured, and this victorious general rode in on a golden chariot, and then priests burned incense in his honor, and the people shouted his name and praised him. And the processions ended at the arena where the people were entertained by watching the captives fight wild beasts and be killed. This was a Roman triumph. It was a sight. This is what they did. But Jesus had a crowd of singing travelers with him. <laughs> you know, can you imagine the Romans looking at this going, what is this? You know, this is odd. I mean, the Roman soldiers didn't feel threatened. There was no anxiety. They were looking through man's eyes, weren't they? Not the spiritual. They didn't know what was happening. I mean, think about this. To earn a Rome, Roman triumph, this is actually documented. You had to win a significant battle, killing at minimum of 5,000 troops. That would earn you a Roman triumph. This is significant, though, if we think about it. Because soon Jesus' victory over death the gospel then conquers why in acts 4 1 through 4 it tells us now as they spoke to the people the priests the captain of the temple and the sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in jesus the resurrection from the dead and they laid hands on them peter and john in custody until the next day for it was already evening however Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Jesus' triumph. A Roman general had to kill 5,000 to earn his triumph ceremony, and Jesus slayed the enemy by redeeming 5,000 after his triumph ceremony when he died on the cross. Awesome! Think about that. With the Romans, it was all about numbers and things on a massive scale. Conquering an enemy by tearing them down and tearing them apart. Making them look bad. With Jesus, it was winning souls with meekness and with humility. I shared this with the guys yesterday. Warren Wiersbe writes this. And think about this in today's society. In this day of mammoth meetings, loud music, and high-pressure promotion... It's difficult for some people to understand that God rarely works by means of the dramatic and the colossal. When he wanted to start the Jewish nation, he sent a baby, Isaac. When he wanted to deliver that nation from bondage, he sent another baby, Moses. He sent a teenager named David to kill the Philistine giant, and the boy used a sling and a stone to do it. When God wanted to save a world, he sent his son as a weak and helpless baby and today, God seeks to reach that world through the ministry of earthen vessels. J. Oswald Sanders states that the whispers from Calvary are infinitely more potent than the thunder of Sinai in bringing men to repentance. God's still small voice is the only thing that brings men and women to repentance. So we see the importance of Jesus revealing himself this way. The people recognize him as Messiah, and it set in motion another prophecy of the Messiah being cut off. I realize, I realize the time. We're getting there. Now, these were the prophecies being fulfilled, and the people recognized it. But one even more profound is discovered here in the triumphal entry, and we can't bypass this, and we can't stop it. We've got to keep learning what is happening here. See, it's the last set of weeks... That is happening here prior to the great tribu tribulation period that we learn about in Revelation. The last set of weeks that we're waiting for. And it's happening after the rapture of the church or the taking away of the church. If you believe in pre-tribulation, I personally believe in pre-tribulation. Why wouldn't I want to believe in that? Because I don't want to be here during the tribulation. <laughs> That's why I want to believe that. But I believe the Bible to be teaching that. 
So what's happening here? What's significant here? What's the prophecy all about? In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, it says this, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. What's he saying? On this day, it's all going to be wrapped up and culminated into this one event, one man. Know therefore and understand, it goes on, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So the Bible, when the command goes out, the Bible gives us four possible decrees that might fulfill this description. One is Cyrus, who made a decree giving Ezra and Babylonian captives the right to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, and that was in 538 B.C. We find this in Ezra 1, verses 1 through 4, and 5, verses 13 through 17. The next one, Darius makes a decree giving Ezra the right to rebuild the temple in 517 BC. We find this in Ezra 6 verses 6 through 12. Third, Artaxerxes makes a decree giving Ezra permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple in 458 BC. Ezra 7, 11 through 26. You got all those scriptures? Then Artaxerxes, number four, makes a decree giving Nehemiah permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to rebuild the city and the walls in 445 B.C., Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Uh, the last one, the fourth one, is the only decree which gives the command to rebuild the city and the walls. The, only ones, the other ones were only to rebuild the temple. This is the one we take as the decree that this is prophesying about. The Hebrew word in Daniel for weeks is actually sevens. There's almost universal agreement among Bible scholars and commentators that this refers to 70 sets of seven years or weeks of years. So what it would look like is 70 periods of seven year cycles, which would equal what? 490 years. So it breaks these cycles in three sets, three sets of times. There are seven sevens, or 49 years, and then it mentions 62 sevens, which all equal 434 years, com or equal thir uh, 434 years combined. These are 483 years. All right? Everybody there so far? 483 years. Many people quote uh, in his book, The Coming Prince, uh, Sir Robert Anderson's calculations. He took the decree given to Nehemiah in Nehemiah 2 on March 14th, 445 B.C. and used the Babylonian calendar of 360-day years along with leap years and all the errors and he came to the exact date of 9 Nisan at this time, the date of the triumphal entry. Isn't that amazing? On that exact day is the years that he's talking about. It's been docu documented that nobody has disproved this calculation. And it places the date at either AD 30, AD 32, or AD 33. But regardless, and whatever method you use, it puts it right in the time of Jesus' ministry. And nobody else fulfilled this but Jesus. So there's no mistaking that this is the Messiah it's talking about which means Jesus is the only one who could fulfill this now we're in this pause right between the 69th 
and 70th week of Daniel. And only seven more years to make up the 490. And that's the time of tribulation. We're in the church age right now. That's what this is called. And it's a pause. Why? So that people can come to repentance. The Lord is being patient and he's waiting. But how much longer? When will the rapture of the church, as outlined in Thessalonians, begin to happen? See, on the prophetic calendar, the last set of sevens takes place after the church is taken out and the church age done. Then comes judgment. Then comes tribulation. And after the three and a half years, then it gets really bad. And we don't want to be here for that. That's why I believe in (laughs) pre-tribulation. Because I believe that's what the Bible teaches. He takes his people out before judgment and destruction. Complete judgment is for We see that throughout the Old Testament. So why wouldn't we see him do that again? Thank God that when you accept Jesus as Messiah, that, your, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and that we're taken out and we're safe. And he goes on in verse 39 and 40 as we begin to wrap up here. It says, And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Isn't it interesting that after all their scheming and critical nature against Jesus' ministry, now they want Jesus to do something for them? They want Jesus to tell his disciples to be quiet. Why? Because it didn't agree with their, uh, their perception of things. See, they, t- they appeal to him right now as teacher. Don't uh, uh, many people do that falsely because they want God to do something for them when they're not true disciples? They want Jesus to do something, even though in their hearts they're ready to kill him. They're ready to get rid of him. He's not only their teacher, he's their savior or their judge. He's either your savior or he's your judge. I mean, he's all of our judge, yes. But we have an advocate with Jesus Christ. And without an advocate, then we have a judge. Just a judge. And I, I want to have my Savior. See, we often read this scripture as nature praising God if people won't, right? Even if I don't say anything, these are going to start talking and praising the Lord, you know? We always think that way. But it may not be the case here. Isaiah 55, 12 says, and why wouldn't we think this way? Because Isaiah 55, 12 says, For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And you think, oh, yes. Proclaiming Jesus, everything's beautiful and wonderful, and nothing ever is going to happen that's bad. You know, the other shoe's never going to drop, you know. And we think if we don't say anything, then nature will. But see, I don't know that it's saying that here. Not everybody agrees on what's being said here. Some say this scene moves from joy to horror. How so? Because the crowd is screaming peace when Jesus is crying in a solemn, sobering way of destruction. How do we know this? Well, in Habakkuk 2, 11 and 12, what does it say? For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. And it was judgment that that prophet was talking about. Judgment being cried out by a stone wall. Judgment is being proclaimed here, and it's a critical, solemn time. Death is a few days away for Jesus. I personally believe Jesus is speaking to them about judgment if they do not repent. And you know, as we moved closer to Jerusalem, what happened to Jesus' parables? They became more solemn, and they became more immediate, and more crucial and striking. When he says, hey, you have to hate all these people if you want to be my disciple and that would make you go whoa right let's think about this for a minute 
as he approaches his parables begin to be more solemn and he begins to talk about judgment more and that's what I believe he's doing because the time is short and you think about what's happening in the world today all the chaos man I have never seen the United States so divided I know everybody in their time says that right but in our time I can't tell you what they felt in their time I can tell you what we feel in our time a nation divided completely neighbor rising up against neighbor killings shootings all of these things taking place we've seen it before these are the birth pangs before tribulation starts judgment is coming things are becoming more serious now we have joy as Christians but we have to tell other people about the seriousness of it of what's happening in this world we have to be ready and we have to know what to say and only say what you know not what you don't know and if all you know is Christ and him crucified that's the only thing you need to know and tell people that but continue on in your journey through the Bible and understand the signs of the times let's pray and as we pray we'll have the worship team come up Lord, we come into your presence, Father, again, and thank you so much for this time and your word. And, Father, we just pray that we go out changed, Lord. We know these are the signs of the times, Father. We know what's happening, but we also know, Father, that we're to be anxious for nothing as believers. And we're to follow and serve you and to be at peace, Father, because you make us walk by peaceful streams and lay down in green pastures, Father. Even in the deepest valleys and the darkest nights, we cannot run anywhere from your love. And we try to sometimes, Lord. We know that you're always with us. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. May we be strengthened as believers in you and know the truth. May we know the truth, Lord. May we not be psychologically motivated May we be biblically and sound-minded, Father. Firmly on your word. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.